even in summer, they should be trying to see the sunrise and the sunset. Absolutely. If they don't, guess what? They're going to pay a toll. Not a fun thing to think about, is it? <laughs> I need you to understand that you have to do certain things that are also would be considered crazy to your family. And you don't worry if you're crazy because you know you're right. They're probably not the guys you want to listen to. You're going to want to listen to Owen She's B podcast with Uncle Jack. Dr. Jack Cruz, thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, I listened to the Andrew Huberman and Rick Rubin podcast and then since then went down many rabbit holes and I'm um, glad to finally speak with you. So could you start with like an introduction of who you are and how you got interested in light and how that can affect our biology and health? Yeah, my name's Jack Cruz. I'm a neurosurgeon. I uh, started down the pathway of uh, quantum biology probably 20 years ago uh, when I realized that centralized healthcare and medicine were impotent in fixing most of the chronic illnesses uh, that we're seeing in clinics. And it led down a big rabbit hole where I basically went from box bar, boxcar biochemistry that you learn about in uh, basic medicine, allopathic medicine, uh, and the foundation brought me to the, the science of nature, which is quantum mechanics. All right, cool. So I think I first came across your work because I kept hearing this thing that like, oh, there's no such thing as like a healthy tan. And I was like, I kept hearing this and I tried to look into it. I'm not, I'm not an expert or anything, but I found some things correlating like more sun exposure and skin cancer, but they didn't really seem to look at sunburns or anything like that. So why do you think that kind of idea is basically nonsense? Why, why can you have a healthy tan? Well, I mean, you're built for it. Um, let's, let's, let's just cut to the chase. Let's talk about why the centralized paradigm wants to bury this information, because if they do bury it, then you become a more successful customer of the pharmaceutical industry. So that's issue number one. But how do you know that this proposition that's brought to you by, you know, centralized healthcare is absolute, utter ridiculousness? You have a, a gene in your body called POM seed. It stands for pro opium melanocortin. Uh, it gets cleaved into six different products. One of the products is alpha MSH that makes melanin. Melanin actually is what creates your tan. So if you're designed not to have a tan, then somebody needs to explain to Mother Nature and Evolution why every single mammal on this planet has the pond C gene. Yeah, okay. So then from there, I think a lot of people would accept that like there is some level of sun exposure that's obviously healthy. Uh, we do want to avoid sunburns though, right? Like we can get too no. much. No? No, that's, that's also another centralized paradigm belief. That's actually never been studied properly. Mm -hmm. uh, and in all the work that I've done, uh, I've, I've tweeted out multiple times, written blogs that even sunburns don't seem to be a major problem. Now, are they comfortable? Are they something sh we should strive to get? No, that's not what we're saying. But are they uh, the huge red flags that the dermatologist or the ophthalmologist or the primary care doctors tell us about? The answer is no. They're, they're not as bad as you think. Um, and it's something like if you had to err on the side of getting a sunburn or blocking the sun from your light, you'd always want to get the sunburn versus blocking the sun. In fact, in your neck of the woods where you come from, at the uh, 59th, 60th, 63rd latitude, the Swedes did a study in 2016 that actually was a meta-analysis of sunlight. It actually showed that if you block the sun, it's equivalent to smoking cigarettes, okay, as in terms of a risk factor. So no one ever talks about the blockade of the sun being a huge problem. Everybody always worries about the fact that you get a sunburn. The, the real issue with sunburns, if you want to be quite frank about this, especially comes from, you know, your neck of the woods where you are. That's where my people originally come from too, the 59th latitude. We tend to have, you know, pale skin because the sun is so weak in those areas. So we don't have as much melanin exposure. 
You tend to have light eyes and green or blue eyes for the same reason so that you can absorb more sun. Remember, when you have less melanin in your skin, you get more sun. So when you do get a day, say it's Scotland or Stockholm or up in the north of, of England where you do get decent sun and you happen to get pink skin, that's, um, that's not necessarily a bad you know, issue. Um, it's something that um, happens very rarely normally in nature, but if you happen to be one of those pasty Englishmen that show up to El Salvador and you don't have uh, what we call the proper solar callus, yeah, expect to get you know, red and white pretty quick, but here's the, the ultimate irony. As a former pasty Englishman myself, uh, I was able to understand the program to build the solar callus. So now I can stay out at the 13th latitude, seven, eight, nine, 10 hours a day. Why is that the case? Because all mammals come with the program that I told you about built into their neuroectoderm. The issue is the environment that you're adapted to best actually determines the quantum yield of that program in you. So for example, uh, and I'm just going to make um, uh, an educated guess. A guy like you and a guy like me, we probably have an H or a K haplotype in our mitochondria. I mean, we're highly uncoupled. Uncoupled haplotypes tend to go with white skin and blue eyes. If you're a coupled haplotype, meaning you come from equatorial Africa, like the East African Rift Zone, you're going to be L0, L1, L2. You're going to have much more melanin in your skin. Why? because the melanin there absorbs all aspects of electromagnetic radiation so that you can absorb it and live well at that environment. About 70,000 years ago, when humans left the East African Rift and migrated north to where you are, what was one of the, the key factors of the, the migration out of Africa? We left along waterways, but we lost our melanin because there was no reason to have really dark skin at high latitudes why was that? That was a quantum yield decision. Why? Because when you're really, really dark and you're at high latitude and the sun sucks, actually you can't make any vitamin D. So why does the body get rid of the melanin the higher you go away from the equator? It's because the sun is weak. The corollary to the light story is what happens in water at the same time. The hydrology cycle, cycle marries up to this issue. So it turns out that deuterium has a higher concentration where people's skin are darker. And as you go higher up to say 59, 60th latitude, the hydrology cycle on earth uh, leads to deuterium depletion naturally. And this allows you to absorb more sunlight um, so that you can perform those things. So when you begin to understand the, the quantum biology that acts, your skin is designed to have less melanin the higher you are in latitude, the further you are from the sun, and the atomic mass that's buried in the water that you create is designed to have less atomic mass. Why? This is the rule of, of Einstein, the law of nature called E equals MC squared. Why? Because mass constrains energy and light is a form of energy. And when you don't have as much solar energy at high latitudes, what happens in, in organisms that are alive that are sentient beings? They actually change their quantum biology. And this is not, you know, really difficult for people to understand once they sit down and listen to what I just told you. Why? Because this effect isn't just present in mammals. Let's, let's make it even more uh, common sense. If I was to sit down with someone in your neck of the woods right now and said, hey, I'd like you to start you know, um, a nursery and let's start to grow coconut trees at your latitude, all of you would sit back in the chair and just laugh. You say, what do you think, we're idiots? And you got that immediately about plants, but what you don't realize, something more common is if you look at the Northern Hemisphere, all along the top of the pole where you guys live at the 59th, 60th latitude, there's something there called the boreal forest. The boreal forest creates more oxygen in the world than any other living thing on the planet, but it has a sharp cutoff at the 60th latitude. So what does that tell you about sunlight? Because we don't see the effect in the Southern Hemisphere. Why? Because we have one continent that's at the pole. 
It's surrounded by the Southern Ocean. There's no land masses there. What it tells you is because the tilt of the Earth at 23 and a half degrees, that photosynthesis has a quantum yield, meaning that living things don't do well at high latitudes above the 60th latitude. Now let's do a hard stop. Let's think about the poor bastards that live in, in Scotland. Let's think about the poor bastards that live in Scandinavia that are above the 59th latitude. And then, then let's take it further. For the people out there that will be listening to this in your neck of the woods that think that this idea is batshit crazy, um, there's a guy who's a dermatologist in, in Scotland named Richard Weller who did a, a TED Talk. I'm, I'm, it's almost 10 years ago. And yeah, it's like, why do, people, you know, why do people die more frequently of cardiovascular disease and hypertension in Scotland. This is the reason why, because there's no UVA light to make nitric oxide to lower their risk. So again, isn't the story back to sunlight? Isn't the same story patterned in nature with photosynthesis because there's no forest that can be supported above the 60th latitude? That's what the boreal forest tells us. And when you begin to understand that photosynthesis is a process in nature that's decentralized that uses sunlight, water, and CO2 to create, you know, glucose and create wood. Okay. Trees are, are made out of thin air. Sounds hard to believe, um, but it's true. And then you have to realize the things that are inside of you, mitochondria, reverse the process of photosynthesis completely. So then you begin to say, well, wait a minute. If photosynthesis has a low quantum yield, that means that the quantum yield of mitochondria also has to be variable. And that gets back to the story that I just told you why guys like you, guys like me are pasty white with freckles, don't have melanin, and we tend to have light eyes. And why people who live in Nairobi, who win all the, the marathons all over the world, are the darkest people on the planet that have really brown eyes. Why? because they're at one degree north latitude, they're tightly coupled, they're at 8,000 feet in the air, that means they're even closer to the sun because they're at elevation. Everything is a story of light water magnetism. The problem is most modern humans are too stupid to realize it, but yet the answers are all around you. They're, they're staring you right in the face, even at the high latitude you live in. I tell everybody, I just traveled up to your neck of the woods a couple of months ago and I, I made the case. I said, isn't it amazing when you go to a place like Iceland, you know, that's pretty high latitude or you go to Norway. Cause I was in Norway at, at pretty high latitude, 69th latitude. You look to your left, you look to your right and you see lava flows that are completely naked. You come down to El Salvador at the 13th North latitude and you don't see any lava flows that are naked. They're covered with dirt and they're covered with plant life. Why is that? It's because of, of the photosynthetic story that I told you. The answer is there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, you're not the first person to think I'm kind of like Nordic. I'm actually, well, I believe I'm from UK. Uh, so I'm near London. Yeah. This is this nobody. Is... Nobody from the UK is from the UK, my friend. Just so you know that. Okay. Uh, the... All of you, all of you are immigrants. In fact, every human on this planet mm -hmm. is an immigrant from Africa. East Africa and we right. know that from yeah. mitochondrial uh, biology. Now, most of you don't like to accept that, but I don't really care about your opinion. That's the truth. And nature nature doesn't really care about our wants, needs, or desires, or our beliefs. Mm -hmm. The fact is we know that homo sapiens, and last time I checked, you don't have big eyes and you don't have a big forehead, so I don't think you're a Neanderthal. You're a homo sapien. That means you came from the East African rift zone and your people over the last 70,000 years moved from that latitude to the 50th to the 55th latitude. And those changes have occurred not only in your neuroectoderm, but also in your mitochondria. And that's what gave you the change in haplotype. Now you don't have to accept any of that. I'm fine with that, but that's the truth. That's the quantum biology of what humans have gone through since they they left africa hmm. that's good i think if people ask where i'm from i'll tell them i'm an immigrant from the east african rift okay all so, of us are technically i mean there's yeah. not anybody 
who's not. But the thing is, we don't think about like that because we have recency bias. You know, we think mm -hmm. about, you know, especially you from the UK, you're going to think about the last thousand years mm -hmm. or the last 2000 years. Like the people that live at Kirkwall in Scotland, they're, they're even more different. They, they know they come from Norway. They know they have Viking heritage. They were stolen by one of your kings in the 1600s because of a dowry. Okay, mm -hmm. but that's the reason why when you listen to them and their dialect, they sound Norwegian. They certainly don't sound like some dude from London. Um, and they understand that. But then even the Vikings understand that they didn't come, you know, from the area of the planet that they thought either. Uh, they came from a different place as well. Why? Because people don't realize that. The story of humanity is greater than 5,000 years. Remember, written history is only 5,000 years old. It goes basically back to probably the Egyptians. The oldest part, like in the country you live in, whether you know this, is Scar Bray up in Kirkwall, Scotland. It's a little bit older, about 500 years older than the pyramids uh, and the story of the Egyptians. So we know the people that originally settled in the UK, likely at that highest latitude, were around 5,500 years ago. I told you the story. When we left Africa, it was 70,000 years ago. So you have to realize that 65,000-year difference is actually when the original journey began. And we don't have any human history written about that. Yeah. Okay. I think this leads pretty well into the, the next thing I wanted to ask was, uh, I think your advice would be like move to a lower latitude. But apart from that, what can people do at a higher latitude? Because if they've listened to you, they'll, they'll know that like the sun has obvious benefits and so does getting the correct light environment. What well, can you can live. I mean, let's just let's unpack that a minute, because I, I want you to understand it's a ridiculous proposition if I was to tell you that everybody who lives at a high latitude needs to move to a low latitude. Why? Because of what I just told you. For at least a thousand years, people in Britain have survived. Now, is there collateral damage, you know, from, from in them and on their body plan because of that choice? Yeah, I'll give you. I'm, I'm going to give you a perfect example. Uh, not to pound on the people in the UK, but let's talk about Prince Charles or King Charles, whatever you want to call him. He has a class two malocclusion. Everybody in the royal family does. Most of the people that live in the UK have a class two malocclusion, meaning their mandible is small compared to their maxilla. We know that that's actually tied to poor light environments. But guess what? That doesn't mean that you can't live at a high latitude for a long period of time. But is that a change compared to, say, the people that built the pyramids. Those are the people called the Anubians who are dark slaves that are out there. We now know from Peter Unger's work at the University of, of Arkansas, he's an expert in mammalian skulls, that when you go back and look at those people who were buried along in the desert, they have perfect dentitions and perfect skulls. You know, that's 5,000 years ago. And we know people in the UK don't have that. They tend to have these changes in their in their morphology. Um, the, the Vikings, we believe, have been in Scandinavia longer than the people in the UK. So they are also hardy people, and they tend to live longer than anybody at high latitudes. So that means there is a plan for biology that you can survive and do really well. What is that survival issue? Let's let's talk about what we know about people from Iceland and Scandinavia who are pretty hardy. It turns out that they live outside. They're in geothermal pools. They do exercise that's heavy lifting. They have hard lives. Uh, they embrace the cold. They always have. Um, those are the things that people who live in that neck of the woods need to embrace. Now, let's talk about you, as a young, modern UK guy, you're soft. You don't do any of that. You live inside. You work out in a gym with blue light. You have blankets on your bed. You don't live out in Scarabray like the people that are your ancestors up at Scotland used to do. They used to live in holes in the ground with animal skins over the top. 
That's the difference. So the plan is when you're exposed to the environment, are there quantum mechanical things that our body allows us to do to be able to survive? The answer is yes. The problem is modern life is not built around those things anymore. Mm -hmm. Modern life is now built around heating, blankets, clothing, um, cars, travel, work at night, artificial light at night. All of those things carry biologic tolls for us. And that's the reason why the NHS is really popular this time of the year when light goes away, people get more sick in the UK. Their blood pressures go up. There's more blood clots in the brain. Uh, there's more diagnosis of cancer um, at this time of the year than there is in the summertime when the sun is, is better. Even though the sun is only good for probably two, two and a half, three months, you know, at the 59th latitude up in Scotland, um, it's a little bit better, obviously, in London, which is at the 50th, 51st latitude. But even there, London is a miserable place to be for usually seven, eight year, seven, eight months out of the year. Um, and the thing is, it doesn't mean that humans can't live at that latitude. That's not really what my message is. My message is, is that when you live at a high latitude, you have to be more connected to nature than less. I'm going to tell you, when you actually live at lower latitudes, you actually have more play where you can actually live more of a modern life because you're at lower latitudes because the sun is so much more powerful for you at that latitude. And there lies the kind of interesting issue because if you're a UK or Scandinavian that's got, say, a mitochondrial disease, then you are best to move to an environment where you have more margin of safety. It's very, very difficult, say, and I'll just use an example because I'm trying to really keep this uh, to your neck of the woods, people in Finland have the second highest amount of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. They're high latitude. I know they're more west of you, or I should say more east of you, um, but they're instructive. If you were a type 1 or a type 2 diabetic in Finland, you would do a really good job of probably spending six months out of the year in the Canary Islands to try to reverse that disease so that you could get things better. But again, would you still have to be more connected to the environment? That's true. And when you went back to Finland, say, after you reverse those diseases, would you likely have to change your lifestyle that actually gave you the type 1 and type 2 diabetes to begin with? The answer is yes. Why? Because quantum biology tells us that you can never get well in the same environment you got sick in. And that is a very counterintuitive thing for modern humans to hear. But why? Because we are slaves for our wants, needs, and desires. You know, nobody wants to take their Netflix away or take their Starbucks away or go into the pub at night away to hang out with their mates, you know, to beat their type one or type two diabetes. But guess what? That's in fact what you need to do uh, to beat it because whether you got the disease or not by your own doing, most people, especially who are type one diabetics, didn't get it from their choices. They their parents gave it to them through transgenerational epigenetics, meaning that there's been five or six decades of people who lived at that high latitude that made poor decisions around light, and that sculpted and changed their mitochondrial DNA. That actually changed the free radical signaling in the mitochondria to change their DNA and RNA so that they wound up destroying the circadian biology of their beta cells in their pancreas. And are there studies out there that I've posted in multiple blogs on multiple Twitter feeds that show you that type 1 diabetes specifically, as well as type 2 diabetes, has a humongous uh, latitude linkage, meaning it's, it's correlation, not causation. But again, that shouldn't matter. Uh, it matters to a lot of idiots that are centralized because they think cause and effect is real. Cause and effect isn't real. We found that out in 1905 when Einstein proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that time is relative. The, the cause and effect can only be operational in reality when time is absolute. Who believed that time was absolute? Newton. That's your countryman. Okay? 
We believe that for 500 years. But the abnormality of the perihelion of Mercury was one of the things that told us for 500 years that Newton had a lot right, but he had something wrong at the core of his ideas. And Einstein, a simple guy who never did an experiment in his life, figured it out by doing a thought experiment in his head. And when he came up with his four miracle papers, um, of course, the world, the centralized world of physics, didn't believe a goddamn thing he said, which is why he didn't get his Nobel Prize for so long. But then during World War I, when your king decided to get into a fight with his cousin, Wilhelm, in Germany, uh, Alfred Eddington, who was a Quaker, a pacifist, actually went to the jungle in Africa and he proved Albert Einstein correct about time, that time is an absolute, time is relative. And a consequence of time being relative is that there is no cause and effect. It's impossible. What does that mean? It means that everything is based on probability. So correlation is actually what we should be talking about, not causation. So many times when you hear people, uh, I, I would say, give criticism on Twitter or social media and say, yeah, but this is correlation, not causation, immediately they announce to you they're morons. And you should absolutely uh, decline to believe anything they say because they don't know the fundamentals of what quantum mechanics is. Quantum mechanics is the science of nature. Quantum mechanics is 100% based on probability, not cause and effect. The interesting thing is the NHS, the FDA, the CDC, everybody who studies medicine believes that the gold standard of studying things is a randomized controlled clinical trial, which tells you that there is cause and effect. That tells you fundamentally that the centralized paradigm is flawed. But nobody realizes they, they don't take it back to where I just took it back to you, to the laws of nature to Newton, to Einstein, and to circle this back up and put a bow on this, um, it turns out that type 1 and type 2 diabetes at high latitude is highly correlated with the high latitude. So what does that tell you? It tells you that circadian biology is at the core issue of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. That is certainly not the message that you get from the NHS, but interestingly, it is the message that Dr. Weller was telling you in between the words that he gave you about the TED Talk. And it tells you that people that tend to have higher blood pressures tend to have diabetes. Why? Because there's no UVA light. So if you know anything about the diagnosis of type 1 and type 2 diabetes, there's a syndrome called metabolic syndrome that has a lot of different things in it. But one of the core metrics that's in it is high blood pressure. Now you know the reason why. Now you know why high blood pressure is correlated with type 1 and type 2 diabetes because it's correlated with high latitude, that is poor UVA and UVB light. It's also the reason why metabolic syndrome and obesity are correlated with low vitamin D levels for the same reason. Why? Because vitamin D levels are highly correlated with UVB sunlight, which you know, especially at your latitude right now on, what's today, October 14th, is horrendous. Yeah. Okay. So I've got a question about correlation. So I, I see what you're saying that that makes sense, but not all correlations are like, I guess, correct. Would that be right to say? How do you like no, differentiate it's, it's, well, between? Well, think about the word that you just used, Owen. Uh, I want to be very, I'm not trying to be um, controversial with you. I'm actually trying mm. to be very accurate. Um, the word correct Okay. This is an opinion. The word truth is actually not, it's not a really good word to use here. Why? Because if you understand what I just told you between Einstein and Newton and fundamentally understand mm -hmm. truly what Einstein means in terms of medicine, that correlation is the key, then you begin to realize there is no correct answer and there is no real truth. Why? Because the truth is subject to new data that comes in. And that actually is exactly what quantum biology is about. Why? Because you can live at a very high latitude like you do and not have type 1 and type 2 diabetes if you're doing more things right than not. Why? Mm -hmm. Because correlation says that you're more probable or not if you live the right way 
you should be okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of that is when you are in the pub too much at night with your mates watching soccer and watching football. Um, and I don't know, say you're an IT specialist or you work for the power company, it's much more likely that mm. you're going to have the problem with type 1 and type 2 diabetes because it's correlated. But realize both of these situations, you could be right in the same spot in England but have two radically different mm. outcomes. One would have type 1 diabetes and one wouldn't. And your conundrum as a young man is to really understand um, how that possibly can happen. And, and what I'm trying to explain to you is actually how that happens because time, in fact, everything is relative in nature because of Einstein's rules, because of how he updated Newton. But we act in medicine like Newton is still right. We, we, we still think that time is absolute. That's the reason why we hear so many people go around saying, um, well, it, it's cause and effect. That's the reason why we do randomized controlled clinical trials. And what makes me, I guess, so controversial and so difficult to deal with with people on podcasts is because they never delve into this area that you and I are delving into very much. And when you actually hear me describe it to you, you're like, this is not the diary of a madman. This is actually somebody who's really thought about this deeply and parsed out the difference of truly what the paradigm of Newton and the paradigm of Einstein really is. Because I think when most people learn physics, um, they they learn the, the basic low-hanging fruit um, that, hey, we use Newton's physics to get to the moon. And that's true. We did. But Newton's physics is not good enough to describe quantum biology and see therein lies the big issue. And since we're alive, sentient beings, and what you really want to talk to me about is medicine and biology, then we have to have this discussion. We have to have this understanding because the next questions that you're going to ask me to follow through on this, if you don't understand where my perspective comes from, you're going to think I'm batshit crazy when it really turns out you're batshit crazy. Understand? Yeah, I think so. That's the, right. And that's the reason why I am such a controversial guy for the FDA, the CDC, the NHS, because their perspective on health fundamentally at, at the most fundamental levels is absolutely incongruent with quantum mechanics. And when you understand that, all of a sudden, you begin to realize why Uncle Jack may have answers that the centralized paradigm can never give you. Okay. Bring, bringing it back to people at high latitudes can live well. It sound, I know you, you've talked a lot about like cold thermogenesis and it sounded like when you were talking about those um, people doing very well in like Scotland and the um, Scandinavia. Iceland. I, Iceland. Iceland are probably the, the highest living, I should say longest living, most healthy people mm -hmm. in all of Scandinavia. Swedes are good, so are Norwegians. The, the people that are Finnish are not as good. They okay. they don't do as well. And then the Poles and Russians have their own problems. Why? Because they use too much alcohol at high latitudes. I think part of the reason why people in the UK and Ireland struggle is for the same reason. They use mm -hmm. alcohol, but different types. You guys tend to use barley and yeast, where the, the Poles and the Russians tend to drink, you know, grain alcohol from vodka. And the real issue with those things is that they dehydrate mitochondria. So if you make less water in your mitochondria, you actually are stressing the system. That means you need more sunlight. So that's why uh, people that tend to have alcoholism at high latitudes tend to have really horrendous outcomes. Okay. So, yeah, you talked a lot about cold for people at high latitudes. I, I believe magnetism can also help. But is there any other things that people should be like what's the like i guess what are the other things that can create the well, magnetic flux you brought that up it's a good one because you know iceland has it the uk sucks at, at having that it used to have a strong magnetic history because you know it is a volcanic uh part of town but uh, i should say on earth 
but that was a long, long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Norway, uh, same way. But Iceland has got that big time line because they're on the hot spot in the North Atlantic now, and that's the reason why they do so well. But the real issue is the people all around you, the Germanic people, the UK people, and the Norwegians, if you embrace the elements, you will do well. Um, the key is you have to realize that means the things that we embrace in modern life are really detrimental at a high latitude, plus you have a smaller margin of safety. So you can't get away with this for two or three or four decades like people in the 13th latitude can. And that's the reason why we see transgenerational diseases like type 1 diabetes all of a sudden show up in Finland. Like in, in the last five or six decades, this has kind of shocked people. Is the same thing, Owen, going on at low latitudes? The answer is yes. And it's going on in India right now. And since your country has such a strong history with India through, you know, uh, the colonial period, realize that for 5,000 years, the Indians who lived at the southern tip uh, have been vegans. They've been doing a lot wrong, too. But the reason they got away with it is because they had more margin of safety, kind of like I explained to you. Why now do we have more type 2 diabetics in southern India than we have anywhere else in the world? That includes the United States. Because now... All the call centers for Google and Facebook are located there. So what's happening? All of those people are now suffering for the same reason that I just mentioned to you that the Finnish people are. So why am I having this discussion with you? Because I really want to parse this out so you understand this isn't really a high versus low latitude story. It seems that way when you're a surface dweller, when you really don't understand the physics that I tried to explain to you between Newton and Einstein. But when you really parse it out and you begin to see it, you're like, wow, Jack's saying that these things show up not only at high latitude, but they're showing up at low latitude. The more that we're, we're discharging ourselves from nature, the more that we're not embracing, you know, light and dark cycles, the more we're not embracing temperature. So let's be clear about this, Owen, because this is at the core of really what you want to be asking me. Why is it that circadian biology only pays attention to two real variables? It's light and dark and temperature. Now you know the reason why. Now you're beginning to get to the core of how the clock system in our eye and the clock system in our biology really works. It's an optical lattice clock that is linked to temperature because temperature tells us not only about latitude, but it also tells us about altitude. How do you know that? You've been in a plane before. You know when you put that stupid little thing on in the plane, it tells you when you're at 35,000 feet, it's minus 40 degrees outside. And you're like, wow, the higher you go up in the air, the colder it gets. Well, think about that. Like, um, for example, when you're in the Alps in Europe, you know, can you make vitamin D at a high latitude in Europe? Yeah, you, the problem is you can only do it in a couple places. Why? Because the mountains are only t uh, high in those areas. But what you should immediately do is go back to the original part of this podcast when I tried to get you to think about Africans and melanin and the boreal forest. Why am I bringing you back and forth? Why am I pulling you here and there? It's because I want you to understand how the clock mechanism really works. In you. It's a optical lattice clock that pays attention to light, dark, and temperature. Mm -hmm. That's how it responds. So when you ask me the fundamental question, hey, Jack, I'm a high latitude liver. How do I live at high latitude and stay healthy? Make sure that you pay attention to your light and dark cycles and the temperature variation. So if for argument's sake, it's Owen, she's be October 14th, the sun rose. I'm just going to guess, okay? Because I don't know what really latitude you're up. The sun rose, let's say it. 4.45 a.m. Was Owen up at 4.45 a.m.? Did he see it? The answer is probably no. And when the sun set, okay, October 14th, I'm going to guess maybe 5, 5.30. Uh, did all the lights in Owen's life go out at 5, 5.30? Oh, he went to the pub that night. Mm -hmm. I got you. So, and then, then the, the last thing is he's got this beautiful, you know, Scottish type of print on right now. Uh, the last time I checked, I don't think any mammals ever come out of its mother wearing a jacket like that. So 
are you really a thermoregulator to your species? The answer is no. See, what I'm trying to explain to you is you are breaking the mechanism in you that pays attention to all these things. So why don't you have as much melanin in you? So if I brought you to El Salvador, because you didn't see the sunrise, you didn't see the sunset, it wasn't dark at night, and you're wearing a, a ridiculous jacket and not having the windows open to allow the temperature that's present at your current latitude to offset your biology. And that would set the thermostat for how much melanin's in your skin. That's how it works, my friend. That's quantum biology 101. That's when you come to my classroom and I explain to you exactly how we work. And I don't really care if anybody doesn't like it. You know why? Because it's the truth based on the best information that we know today. Now, that doesn't mean it's not going to change because it can change. In, in our biologic history, as I mentioned in the Uberman podcast, you heard it. I told you the first wideband semiconductor we ever had was was uh, chlorophyll. The second one was hemoglobin and the third one was melanin. So what am I telling you? These things are innovated in evolutionary history to pay attention to the light and dark cycles and temperature. And that's the reason currently why we have so many different hemoglobins in the mammalian tree. It's also the reason why we have so many different chlorophylls in plants because these things are how we adapt to the changing EMF environment, the sun. The problem is we happen to be the silly talking monkeys that have changed the EMF environment because now you have headphones on your head and you wear those iPods in your ear and you go out and listen to Coldplay at night and you, you, know, you do all the things that you don't even think that are an EMF problem because they're not consistent with the EMF from the sun. Hmm. And therein lies the reason why people at the UK are different than the people in India, the different people in the United States that are different than the people in Africa. This is the reason why we have variations all over the place. It's fully explainable quantum mechanically, but do you know why people don't understand it? Because they haven't done the heavy work thinking mm -hmm. like what we're doing in this podcast right now. I can see as I talk to you, I can see your face and your eyes. I hope you look back at yourself when we do this and you go, wow, this is beginning to make a lot more sense to me talking to this guy. And that's the whole point. That is the whole point of doing podcasts. I yeah. want people to understand that what I'm telling people isn't crazy talk. Dude, this is the best medical advice you're ever going to get from anybody. Mm -hmm. But I need you to understand this perspective so that you don't think that I'm crazy. So like when I said to Owen earlier, him and his mates are not going to start a coconut farm in the UK because that is utterly ridiculous. Now you begin to realize by asking me the question, well, sunburns are clearly bad, right? Well, are they? From my perspective, you begin to realize maybe they're not. Maybe it's okay to go to Hyde Park, take all my clothes off and put a kaniki on and get a sunburn. It, it makes maybe a lot more sense than wearing a plaid jacket inside with headphones on my head and wondering, you know, why I'm trying to stay healthy the rest of my life. That's the kind of insight that I want to bring to the people that live at the high latitude. I don't want all of you to think that you need to move to El Salvador. You need to move to the Canary Islands. That's not the goal. The goal is I want you to understand why you're getting sick now, why the NHS is, is you know, offering you COVID shots when you really don't need them. Um, there is a reason these things are happening. And I think the smarter you are, uh, I've said this in multiple podcasts, but I'm going to say it here again because I think it's important. In Darwin's time, 1859, another UK guy, he always told you it was about the survival of the fittest. What do I tell people now? It's no longer about the survival of the fittest. Now we're about the survival of the wisest. Okay? And what is this podcast that I'm laying out to you? This is the wisdom that Darwin never had. Why? Quantum mechanics wasn't present in his life. Remember, his whole idea was based around the Newtonian idea of absolute time and time over long periods of time. 
But what are the things in biology that absolutely break Darwin's theory or of species? And you know this because you said you listened to the Urban podcast. The two things that really are a problem for Newton are the age of mammals. In other words, how mammals came to be. But the other big one is the Cambrian explosion. Mm-hmm. Like if it's really about, you know, small mutation changes, then why all of a sudden do we have 32 phyla in the fossil record literally overnight 650 million years ago? That totally blows his stuff out of the water. And then if you don't want to use the big history, let's go to the small history that I always use. Uh, 1900, United States, colon cancer was the 37th leading cause of cancer. Today it's number two. Explain in 125 years how it went from 37 to two if, if Darwin's right. Oh, he's not. Why? Because it goes back to what we just talked about. You will never understand Uncle Jack's ideas until you understand the difference fundamentally when you milk it all down, comes down from an understanding of time. Absolute time and relative time is the reason why this has happened. And there's been more environmental changes in the last 125 years that have led to that change. That's what has changed the the, uh, genome-wide changes that you expect, that you see in the literature. It's called GWAS. Um, people don't realize that GWAS was preceded by mitochondrial ROS and RNS changes that are fundamentally tied to alterations of the light, dark, and temperature cycle. And when you put all this together, and this is like a soup, and you sit in this and you listen to this podcast over and over and over again, because you're right, I'm not slowing down. I'm giving it to you through a fire hose. I want you to keep understanding that once you get to the level I want you at, then and only then will you begin to realize that the guys in NHS, the guys in the FDA, the guys who you're going to see, you know, I don't know, to get cerumen taken out of your ears, they're good for certain things. Like if you break your arm, you get a subdural hematoma, you break your neck. But if you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes or you have metabolic syndrome, they're probably not the guys you want to listen to. You're going to want to listen to Owen She's B podcast with Uncle Jack and go, shit, now I understand why going out with my mates and drinking beer at night is a real problem for my diabetes. Mm, yeah, you said it a lot there. I'm definitely going to have to go back and, and digest all of this. But it's interesting you mentioned temperature a lot because I especially... Actually, I didn't mention it, Owens. Just so you know, when you go back and listen to this, because I want you to fact check yourself. You're the guy that brought temperature up first because you mentioned cold thermogenesis. Mm-hmm. Why did I bring it up? Because I'm trying to explain to you how temperature fits into the framework of circadian biology because you're a high latitude guy. Realize that cold is a huge benefit for you. Mm. Yeah. Humongous. The problem is most people that live at a high latitude truly don't embrace the cold as mm. much as they should. And that's the point I'm trying to get to. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, people who live at the 13th latitude, it's kind of funny. Like if you're in El Salvador now, you would see people when it's 70 or uh, I don't know what the temperature is in Celsius, but 70 Fahrenheit, which I guess would be like 17, 16 or 17 C. Yeah. They're walking around yeah. with jackets that you guys would wear, you know, when it's December. Mm-hmm. And that relativity tells you. But remember, those people that are down there have way more melanin in their skin. So they can't handle wide swings in temperature. That's the reason why they, they struggle with CT. But people that have less melanin in their skin that have light eyes, they tend to do phenomenal with CT. Why? Because their haplotypes also are uncoupled. They're designed to work better in cold environments. Yeah. I was just going to say that I have been paying attention to light like pretty well, I would say, over the last few years. But cold has been a bit more recent i didn't realize how important it really can be and it's i didn't i didn't know that cold was really that related to circadian biology oh it's huge i kind of thought it was just like a separate thing well let's since you said that let's 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 get something in your head not only for you but also for your audience so they get it i want you to think about light and dark like the minute and hour hand i'm going to tell you the sunlight is like the hour hand on a clock 
the darkness at night is like the minute hand on a clock. Then temperature is like the second hand on the clock. They're all important to tell the time, but one is more important than the other. So the hour of the day is critical because that gives you a pretty good idea of, you know, when it's time to eat dinner, okay, or when it's time to eat breakfast. The minute hand tells you within that hour what's the issue, and that's really how you should look at darkness. And the second issue, the temperature variation, it's a huge factor. And if you, you want to hammer this point home, realize that this is the reason why melatonin works better when you're colder. Okay, this is the reason why when you sleep at night, okay, yeah. that your hypothalamus has to drop four degrees, usually C, in and around your hypothalamus so that you sleep better. And see, when I said that to you, I could see in, even in your face, you're like, oh, shit, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Now you begin to understand why temperature is that important because it augments the circadian mechanism that ties to autophagy and apoptosis that actually keeps you healthy at night. So if you can't sleep, like say if you're the guy that goes out to the pub all the time and you have type 2 diabetes and you're drinking beer at night and you're around light, you never can drop your melatonin or your temperature low enough to make the melatonin come out. So this is the reason why you have sleep apnea. And this is the reason why you keep getting fatter and fatter and fatter because you are breaking all the rules. Like your second hand never works. Your minute hand is always slow and your hour hand is way off. Then you begin to go, okay, now I'm starting to see the world as Jack does. It's a giant metronome. Every single mitochondrial disease is a metronome that's tied to light, dark, and temperature. And when you're able to put all those biochemicals together that you do know and you put them in this framework, you begin to go, okay, this is beginning to make a lot more sense to me. You're going to be a way smarter patient than the doctors that you go to see. And ultimately, isn't that my goal when I do podcasts with guys like you? The answer is yes. Because I think a lot of times when I do podcasts, people misunderstand a lot of the things I say. Like, you almost went down that path before I pulled you by the neck. No, you don't have to go live at a low latitude to be healthy. You can live at a high latitude and be healthy. I just did a podcast with two Viking guys that got released, I don't know, about two weeks ago. I told them the same thing I'm telling you. That no, you can do really well. But the funny thing is when I talk to them and I'm talking to you, I don't think they realize the nuance between timing. And that's the reason I decided to really get into the discussion with you about the difference between New Newtonian physics and Einsteinian physics. The fact that when time is absolute, cause and effect is real. But when time has been proven to be relative, there is no cause and effect. Everything's based on probability. That means correlation matters more than causation. There is no cause to disease. It's all a correlative event. Everything is based on probability. And that that is so offensive, Owen, to the people uh, that you know regulate centralized paradigms mm -hmm. that you need to really understand that and fundamentally that's i think what makes uncle jack so a tough swallow for a lot of people but i think when you hear it laid out like this you begin to realize this guy isn't crazy at all he's thought actually thought about it very very deeply and he can explain it you know in a podcast so you get it and you know i think the reason I've spent a lot of time with the two Viking guys and you on this is because you are the high latitude guys. And you have to remember something. We have something in common. I'm a high latitude guy. Dude, I come from County Cork. I'm 59th latitude, bro. So if you don't think that this was important in the formation of me figuring this out 20 years ago, you're out of your mind. I, I absolutely got it. And that's the reason why I started first with the leptin prescription, then I went to the cold thermogenesis protocol because you're probably now starting to realize, now I get why Jack did what he did. He fixed his hour and his minute hand, then he went to the second hand, the cold part, then he put it all together. And you can begin to see how this was kind of like a, a Ford factory to make an F-150. I was coming up with the ideas and then correlated them back 
to the physics of organisms, but ultimately the physics of organisms funneled all the way back to our friend Einstein and Newton. And that's when biology began to make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I, w- I want to be mindful of your time. Do you need to step off soon? Or you could take oh, I'm, on tra- I'm on trauma call, so I'm good for now. But I will tell you something cool is going on right now. Mm-hmm. Behind me, the eclipse is oh. going. So right now, where I'm at, let me look at the time. Yeah, the eclipse right now is happening at the 28th latitude. So half the sun is covered by the moon. Mm-hmm. So what I'd like to do is I want to look out and see if I can see it. Yeah, go for it. It is. The, the sun, if you look up in the sky, looks like a half a sun. It's pretty cool. And, you know, the reason I, I noticed that is because it got dark here. Mm-hmm. We have about a 50% eclipse because we're off. But I looked at your, your window right now, and you don't have that because you're far away. Where this eclipse is happening right now on October 14th is uh, going through, I believe, it's going through San Salvador, but it's going through, I think, Texas, El Paso, and west of me. Uh, mm. I'm right now at the 28th latitude. Um, Louisiana. But it's pretty It's pretty cool. I just noticed when I was talking to you that I saw the sun drop, you know, the power. And it'll only stay like this for probably a couple minutes. But yeah. this is the first time I think I've ever done a, a podcast during an eclipse. That's, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. You, you said that light is the the hour hand so essentially like the most important one how do what with with where i'm at uk when we get to the depths of winter you can get to like less than eight hours of daylight and a lot of people obviously don't want to be in bed 16 hours a day so how do we set up our light environment the best we can that's the problem the best you can has to be better than some of these right well you have to use that but i mean i would tell you the other big issues you got to get up with mm-hmm. the, the solar awesome. cycles. So guess what that means? It means shifting your whole life. And I understand that in the modern world, you know, your job and things like that may not be set up for that, but you have to do as good a job as you can. So mm-hmm. the single most important thing for a metronome who understands circadian biology is you have to eat and live with that sunrise. You must see the sunrise every day. Then the flip side of that is when the sun sets, try to see the sunset, but make sure that no artificial light at night after that. So that's where those glasses become important. But I'm still going to tell you, do I think seeing the sunrise for high latitude uh, livers are extremely important? Because you realize that the sunrise, as you get closer to December 31st, your latitude is getting later and later in the day. So it could be eight o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. but the sunset on December, you know, thirty first or twenty first could be at three thirty. Mm-hmm. You know, depending on where you are in, you know, uh, Scandinavia or the UK. Um, so you have to be mindful of that. And then the flip side of that is when I was up at the high latitudes, you know, several months ago, uh, I did a podcast with a guy from Uruguay at eleven thirty at night when the sun was still out i was at the 69th latitude it was kind of crazy but do you have to be mindful of that when you're at high latitude that you need more sun and oh and i'm going to tell you something i don't think a lot of people at high latitudes really understand um and when i say it it's going to take you a while to realize it and research it do you realize that if you live at the equator or you live at the 50th or 60th latitude that the amount of sunlight you get is exactly the same. The difference is the time is shifted. So let me explain to you what I mean. There's times in Alaska that the sun stays out all year round. Mm -hmm. That makes up for the days that it's hardly out at all. But if Mm -hmm. you measured the time of each day, the amount of sunlight that would be present is exactly the same as it would be on the equator. In a whole year, right? Yeah, you got it. Okay. The problem is it's at the wrong time of the day based on how our clocks work. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why people at high latitudes get things like mental illness and SAD because of this reason. And it's also the reason why I told you earlier. So what you need to realize is that the real problem of high latitude living is light stability, meaning 
that you need to have a firm part of your day where you're really in the light. Well, that's really difficult when you live in the UK and your job requires you to be at work from say eight to four. Well, that's the whole time the sun is out. Mm. The question is, you got to say to yourself, when did I see the sun? The answer is probably not. So the number one thing I think people that live at a high latitude have to do is figure out how to get outside, whether it's cloudy or not, because you're still getting the benefit of the sun even then when it's cloudy. You're still getting the red light. You're still being able to tell the color temperature. The clock mechanism still works. doesn't change at all. Um, the temperature also plays a, a, a role there as well. So you being inside is a huge problem too in the winter time. So you need to understand that issue. And I think when you parse it out, then you begin to understand why Uncle Jack's not a big fan of laying in a high latitude because your job is really, really difficult mm. to get right at a high latitude. This is the reason why living at a lower latitude gives you more margin of safety. Why? Because we have to zero degree latitude. I remember it's 12 hours of sunlight every single day. It doesn't vary at all. Like when um, you talk about the 13th latitude or the, 20, or the 20th latitude, because 20th latitude is Cancun, 13 is El Salvador. I'll give you an example because I was just in El Salvador uh, last week. Um, there's only about a 30 to 35 minute variation at the 13th latitude, even at this time of year. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that the sun sets almost every day at 6.30. It rises every day right around 6.30. So you're kind of like, okay, well, that's how my clock is set up. That's how my day is set up. That's not true for a guy like you. Mm -hmm. the, the sun uh, rise and sunset varies tremendously from September through December and also from December through April. Uh, and the problem is you have to retool your life to marry to that and that's not an easy task mm. okay yeah since learning about your work i've got there is a window open here so it's actually colder than it looks and i Good. have the sunlight coming through in the morning so it's quite cool actually um okay so this is less margin of safety uh, okay so that's that's for the winter and then in the summer it's so, so see as much sun as possible as you can in winter. Yeah, because remember in the summertime, there's like certain times in London it's... where the sun doesn't set till 10, 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So if you're out, great. But remember, the sunrise sometimes, like the last time I can remember when I was in Europe, I think I was at the 60th latitude. And I'm talking about when I was not, in, not this past trip. Um I think I was in Poland. I think the sun rose on July 4th at 3.45 a.m. I was the only guy that was awake. All my other European friends were still asleep who were from there. And yet when they came out an hour later, like, Jack, you're here? And here's the funny part. It was 37 Fahrenheit, which for you guys is probably like two, two or three degrees. degrees yeah. deep. I was in a T-shirt and shorts in 40-mile-an-hour winds on the 4th of July at the 60th latitude. And they all looked at me and I looked at them and I said, why am I out here? I said, you wanted me to come visit you? This is what I have to do when I come visit. Wow, okay. So you do still want to be even at high last year? Absolutely. In sync. Look, I'm, I'm coming to London. I'm coming to London literally five days. I'm not excited about it. Okay, but do I know that I'm going to have to change my template? Yep. And am I doing something? I'm, I'm going to be living my craziest month of my life. And I'm going to tell you it's already started because I'm on trauma call now. But the things that I'm going to do in the next month, I have never done in my life. And they are going to be the biggest circadian disruptors that you can imagine. And... Have I had to think about how I'm going to pull this off so that I don't harm myself thinking about all the things that I told you? Why, why are we having this discussion? Because I have been planning this year because I've done some very dramatic things. I, I went to the 69th latitude in the summer. Okay. Now I'm going 
to the 60th latitude. I wouldn't say in the winter time, but pretty damn close. It's already past the autumnal equinox. Mm. This is not something I normally do. Are there reasons I'm doing this? Yeah, you might hear about that somewhere down the road. But the reason I'm having the discussion I'm having with you, I want you to understand that I believe you can still win doing some of the most extreme things in the world, but you have to do things that nobody else would consider doing. Mm -hmm. And to do that, that's how you avoid the FDA, the NHS, the CDC. That is the story of being a black swan mitochondria. To understand truly how we are creatures of light and temperature. Um, I think that probably is the most important story to get through to people right now, you know, in the modern world. Why? Why? Because this, this decentralized medicine idea is so radically different than what you get from the centralized paradigm. And um, I want people, especially young people like you to understand that I still think you can win. I think you can be optimal even when the environment is not set up perfectly for you. But it means that I need you to understand that you have to do certain things that are also would be considered crazy to your family. And you don't worry if you're crazy because you know you're right. Because you know the science of what you and I talked about an hour ago. You understand finally for the first time in your life why Newtonian physics and Einsteinian physics matter to circadian biology and why temperature matters to why time is relative. And when you begin to put all this together and you think about the things that we've talked about, you're a far smarter human, silly talking monkey, than you were than an hour before listening to this podcast. That's all I care about. Mm -hmm. I, I'm looking to upgrade my audience one percent every day okay so just so like i'm c clear because say someone's like a very high latitude like 60 or whatever they should even in summer they should be trying to see the sunrise and the sunset absolutely if they don't guess what they're going to pay a toll okay because i know some places not, fun, not not a fun thing to think about is it <laughs> <laughs> Some places I know it can get to like four hours of darkness or something. So, yeah. Correct. Like I can tell you when I, 4th of July, I, I specifically remember it. I was at the top of Poland, you know, right on the North Sea. Mm. It The sun rose at 3.45 a.m. and I was out in it. Mm. It didn't set until 11.15 and I was out in it. But do you, would you not want to be sleeping more? Is that a stupid question? No, it's not a stupid question. It's actually a question you should ask yourself. So one of the things that I did when I was at Poland at that level, from about uh, 7 p.m. to 11, 11, 15, uh, we convinced the hotel that we're staying in to let us change all the light bulbs to red light. And that's what we did. We actually had red light on. What else did we do when we were outside? with you know the europeans that wanted to meet and talk with me we had fire on big sticks they put mm. these huge embers in the ground and made them like candles kind of like you would see like at viking time and we did that now is that something that uncle jack would normally do at the 13th latitude or the 28th latitude the answer is no some people know that i'm i'm a little bit of a pyromaniac and i do like fire i will use fire in different places I also use candles, but the one thing I don't use, I don't use artificial light at all. Mm. Yeah, there's something about fire. I don't know. I wonder if it's like because we evolved, I think, a decent amount of time with it. The, I don't well, know. Well, if, you, if nice. you've listened to my recent podcast or read some of my Patreon posts, you'll actually find that fire was one of the things that sculpted Neanderthals to Homo sapiens. Mm. Uh, it's actually... The reason why Homo sapiens are a little bit more creative than Neanderthals. In other words, fire and living inside caves actually shrunk our brain. And when you actually think about it from that standpoint, 
you start to look at fire a little bit differently. Fire also was the first, first version of artificial light at night. Mm. And it wasn't so beneficial for the Neanderthals. Ironically, it created some very good effects in silly talking monkeys who are homo sapiens. Why? Because we have 125 grams less brain tissue than them and our eyes are smaller. But remember, we came from lower latitudes than the Neanderthals. But they, they really stopped right at the latitudes that you're at now. You're, you don't find very many Neanderthal skeletons above the 50th, 55th latitude. And there's a reason for that, because their Ferrari engines in their head precluded them from living there. And it, that tells you a, a big story about Homo sapiens. It tells you the reason why if you break the rules and you live at a high latitude, why people in the UK will get more neurodegeneration, more cerebral atrophy, your brain shrinks even more. And this should be something that the NHS expects, but they don't. They don't see the story that I'm painting for you right there. Um, and it's a very, very interesting story, um, but it's playing out everywhere at high latitudes. It's really playing out in the United States. Why? Because the number one cause of death in the United States, everybody still wants to call it heart disease. No one wants to tell you the truth, but it's really Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. It's neurodegeneration. And the reason for that has a lot to do with many of the things that we've talked about in this podcast. Why? Um, the United States has made a decision uh, in the way in which it runs its economy um, to use a lot more non-native EMF for its population. And our population centers are very different than what you see in the UK and Europe. Remember, Europe is a much smaller continent. People are in cities, but they're closer. And the United States is a huge country, and our population densities tend to be in cities that are sitting you know, right around massive amounts of EMF made by, you know, Facebook, Google, uh, AT&T, and this creates a certain problem. And remember, most people in the United States, where are they from, my friend? We're uh, Brits. Europe. We're Brits that got fed up with the fucking king, right? So that means we are all have the same haplotypes as you guys. Mm -hmm. So we have a very interesting set of circumstances here in the United States that you guys don't face. You face it for different reasons than we do, but our steep decline has a lot to do with where we come from and the things that the decisions that we made around light. That's the reason why the United States health metrics look so different than anywhere else. But people don't realize that 250 year change when we told King George to go fuck himself um, and where we became the superpower and then turned our agrarian economy into a technology economy, uh, it's had huge implications for us. Mm -hmm. You talked a bit about like the NHS and like the FDA not understanding the story that you've laid out there. Do you think you've managed to get through to Huberman enough that he'll like, that he'll take all that stuff on board and like be able oh, to I make a I've change? Got I think I've gotten through to him, but I think the mm. real problem for Uberman is remember who funds his lab, Stanford, Stanford, or who funds Stanford, Big Pharma. Uh, don't think Uberman's stupid enough not to realize what the collateral effects of that are. Um, but at the same time, um, what do I teach people? What What is decentralized medicine fundamentally about? When you know you're right, even if you have to stand alone, you stand alone. Why do I do podcasts the way I do? I, I don't care if the paradigm that I practice in is wrong. My duty is to do no harm. It's to come and tell you the truth, the truth that I understand right now and lay it out for you. And then you, the audience, you, the podcasters, you'll decide whether I'm batshit crazy or maybe I need to be listened to. Maybe... Maybe there's some wisdom in what I'm telling you. Maybe is this the reason why I can explain more things than your doctor can in the NHS about certain diseases they are impotent to fix? 
See, that's a decision for the public to make, not for Uberman to make. Mm -hmm. The problem is the centralized paradigm is the one that wants to make those decisions for the public now. That's actually what the NHS does. And I think that's fundamentally why the paradigm is not good for people who live in the UK when you follow the NHS dictates because they are still working on Newtonian time. And when you realize that, then you realize they're also making a mistake because every study that they use comes to the United States that's based on mammals that are studied where? In a lab with blue light and non-native EMF around them. You start going, why do we believe this shit? And then you start thinking about the things you and I talked about in this podcast, about the hour, about the minute hand, the second hand, how light and dark and temperature varies all this. And then you think about all those little mice and rats and the humans that have been studied for the last 150, 200 years. And you're like, man, I'm starting to see a different side of science than I ever saw before. And guess what? That's why they say putting sunlight on things is the best disinfectant because you actually get a little wiser. You get a little smarter. See, it's not about you going to the gym and working out and getting big, huge muscles. It's about you working that brain out in your head, making sure it doesn't shrink so that you're wiser than the idiots at the NHS, the FDA. Uh, that's the reason why the people in Sweden broke ranks with the rest of the people in the EU and did COVID different than everybody else. You guys all made fun of them, but now you got egg on your face. Turns out the Swedes were right. So guess what? I'm hoping that the next time uh, the dominant paradigms that are, that are driving health in the UK, which are the World Economic Forum, the Royal Family, all the fucking idiots out there that are trying to turn you back into feudal slaves, you begin to realize that you have something in common with your patriots uh, in Sweden, that you need to question everything. And when you begin to question everything and you're told stupid things like, yeah, with COVID, you need to wear a mask and you need to go inside. And you think about what Owen and I talked about, about light and dark and temperature. You start to go, that's about the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. And then... You can sit down with your grandmother over tea and explain why Boris Johnson needed to be fired because he's the one that told you that lockdowns were a smart thing. Doesn't mean that the idiot you got in now is any better, just like the idiot we have is no better. The bottom line is, remember, your country and my country are built around the same idea. It's about we the people. People in the United States are a little bit more forceful. I think we got the best British people, if you want to know the truth. Why? Because we were the people that wouldn't take the bullshit from the king. I think the same thing is happening right now in the UK. I think there's people that are fed up with the NHS. I think there's people fed up with King Charles, to be quite frank with you. Um, but I think that those faction of people, not only they are in the United States, they're in Sweden, they're in Africa, they're in El Salvador. They're really in El Salvador right now because they have a king or a leader or a president who's basically telling people freedom is what it's all about. You should be able to make your own decisions about your own health care. You don't need to listen to your employer. You don't need to listen to a doctor. You, you, the only thing you need to do is sit down with a doctor to explain to you how we really work, and then you decide if you think it's a good idea to wear jackets and use air conditioning and use blankets and turn the sun off like Bill Gates or, you know, put artificial light on at night when you're drinking with your mates at the bar. Ultimately, I think that's your choice. If you want to kill yourself, you should be allowed to do it. But if you want optimal health, that there should be a template out there for you to sit down and listen to podcasts like this. So you begin to realize that some of the most counterintuitive things that you ever heard may be the smartest things you've ever heard. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned that like being healthy isn't about like going into the gym and getting strong muscles. Uh, but you also mentioned earlier that the, a lot of the Scandinavians do kind of lift heavy weights and stuff. 
I, I just want to try and clarify something for myself here, really, that I heard you saying that if you're lifting weights, like, outside in the sun, then that probably seems to be okay. Is, like, any muscle building mutually exclusive with, like, longevity? Is it taking the mitochondria from our brain and heart into the muscle? Yeah. Is there any this, this, this way is a great that question. would be okay? I think, I think this is a great question because I think it's the biggest mistake that's present in longevity research. In fact, one of the guys that I've been railing on Peter recently, Adia. just because he's friends with Uberman, is Peter Adia. And um, he's written a New York Times bestselling book that mm -hmm. I vehemently disagree with because if you're a mitochondriac and you understand fundamentally what Doug Wallace has said, that every 10, every decade, we lose about 10% efficiency in heteroplasm. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. It means that our mitochondria are losing power as we age. That's a normal consequence of aging. That means if you go and build a tissue up to have hypertrophied mitochondria, and you're not a mammal that's designed to have those big muscles, you are effectively creating a Robin Hood situation where you're stealing energy from your heart and your brain, which since you are a silly talking monkey, that's where we bury our mitochondrial capacity it makes absolutely no sense to do that. Hmm. And this really isn't a teleologic argument. This is actually a thermodynamic argument. And I have decided to wage this war with him over podcasts like this because I want people to actually think about this. I don't want people to think he's right or I'm right. I want people to actually parse this out for themselves once they understand fully the perspective that I'm giving you right now. Like when they go back and listen to the beginning of this podcast and I explain to you how the light, dark, and temperature cycle works in terms of thermodynamics, and then you think about what we just talked about, about muscle mass, the silly, the, the talking, I should say, the monkeys that are designed to have huge muscles are the gorillas, but they also have not Ferrari engines in their head. That's what makes them different than us. And the reason why they need that is because they're adapted for different environments than we are. The flip side is we're the silly talking monkeys that do have the Ferrari in our head because it gets 20% of our cardiac output. That means, that doesn't mean that exercise is bad. It doesn't mean that the meatheads in Iceland are not doing ish, you know, things wrong. And I'm not telling you that you can't work out and have good muscles. I'm just telling you, if you live at a high latitude, you probably don't want to hypertrophy your skeletal muscles past the age of 50 because that's a loser. And if you don't believe me, just go look at human history. Very rarely will you see humans that have humongous muscle mass as they age. In fact, you look at the programs, and I always talk about this guy called Mir Barzilai, who Peter Adia actually likes, but I don't think Peter Adia really understands what Neil Barzilai's done. He studies super centenarians. You know, these are Americans that have lived over 100 years old. And what, are these, what does he always find? They don't have big skeletal muscles. Okay. And that's really the take home message that if you really want to live a long life, you probably would be wise to have good muscles for maybe the first 50, 60 years of your life. But every decade after that, you want to reserve your energy for your heart and your brain so that you can get to your 80s, 90s, and 100s. That's really the key story. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, and then if we are going to be working out, we want to be doing it in a place that's not under blue light and ideally outside in the sun. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you're going to lift heavy things, I want you to do it in the sun. That's, you know, at least in my country, this is why I tell people about the, the meatheads in Venice Beach. Mm -hmm. At least they do it right. Then, you know, I make fun of, of guys that are in the States, like Sean Baker is a big carnivore guy, orthopedic surgeon who likes showing his muscles all around. But I always point out he's still an orthopedic surgeon. He's not as smart as a neurosurgeon. He certainly doesn't understand some of the things that we're talking about here. But do I respect that he's trying to help people get better? Yeah. But I want him to understand what I just told you, that having huge muscles is a huge constraint on your brain. And when you understand that our brain is the Ferrari engine that actually never changes its, its thermodynamics as we age, 
then you begin to realize uh, maybe, you know, going and doing all the things that he does is probably not the smartest thing. And it's also probably not the smartest thing that Peter Adia does. And I'm not doing and saying this stuff out these guys as fools. You have to realize, I think they're both smart guys. The problem is I don't think they've thought about this as deeply as I have as deeply as I explained to you in the beginning of this podcast, you know, to understand truly the implications of what Newtonian physics and Einsteinian physics means for your muscle mass. Because when you actually parse this out, you begin to realize this is really a thermodynamic story that needs to be told. It's actually the greatest story on earth ever told. Why? Because this really is about the fountain of youth. This really is about how to optimize your longevity. Um, I just think you need to be smart about how you do it. And I think when you try to give a one size fits all to everybody and you realize what is quantum mechanics really teaching us, everybody's in N equals one because everybody has different choices they've made around light, dark, and temperature. That's the key. Mm. Have you reached out to either of those guys and tried to do a podcast with them? Uh, let's put it this way. I think every podcast I've done in the last year it's been a full frontal assault on on Peter Adia. Uh, Sean Baker has reached out to me, wanted me to do his podcast. I refuse to do it. Oh, okay. uh, the reason I refuse to do it is for what I just told you. Until Sean Baker understands exactly the perspective that I have. I'm hoping a guy like him will listen to this podcast I did with you hmm. and understand fundamentally why he's incorrect is because he doesn't understand Newtonian and Einsteinian physics. In fact, I've been told uh, by people in the know who know Peter Adia very well, the reason he doesn't want me on his podcast is because he's like, this guy only talks about physics and I don't want to talk about physics. What does that tell you? It tells you that he wants to stay at the boxcar biochemistry level because that's where he feels comfortable. Well, I got news here. I'm comfortable at that level too. Because I learned that stuff, but I realized that wasn't the thing that was getting me better. Mm. Yeah. I just wonder if with like Sean Baker or maybe even like Paul Saladino, I know he's interested in your stuff as well, that did that could be an opportunity for you to like reach a lot more people and kind of show them. Like if you literally talk Sean I, 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 But Owen, you're making you're making a big assumption here and I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to, I don't want to say cut you off the knees, but I want you to understand something. I'm yeah. not interested in being popular. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm interested in? Yeah. Being right. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in getting the story right. Why? Because if you know the story of human evolution, I don't want to get 8 billion people this message. Okay. Uh, when we left Africa, we got down to about 100,000 people. And then we went from 100,000 to 8 billion. What does that tell you? You don't need a lot of people to get this right. You just need a lot of people um, to get it right in different parts of the world. I'd like to have, let's say there's 196 countries. I'd like to have 100 people in every country get this message. Why? Because then those 100 people can disseminate this information across the land. And, and let me just tell you, I have no illusions. Not everybody's going to get this message. This is mm -hmm. not an easy message to assimilate and get in. But the thing is, before I die and get put in the ground, I don't want anybody telling me that I didn't tell people the truth. So mm. I feel like the first 40 years of my life as an allopathic doctor, that I hurt more people than I helped. Now I feel like the last 20 years that I'm really helping people because I'm showing them the decentralized way that biology needs to work. And ultimately, and this is the true decentralized part of me that I think people have a huge problem with, I learned a lesson from evolution. Not everybody will survive. That's what extinction events are about. And not everybody is going to be wise. Mm -hmm. And it's not about saving everybody. It's about those people who care enough about themselves to realize that they have to question the status quo so that they get the message. I don't want to convince Peter Adia. I don't want to convince Sean Baker. I don't want to convince Paul Saladino, and I certainly don't want to convince all your mates in London, but the ones that will listen to this podcast mm -hmm. that say, hey, Owen, 
instead of going to have a pint of beer at the, the place, let's go back to the, the house and put some candles on and talk about what actually Jack said, the implications of that. Guess what? Those are the people that I'm interested in. Okay. Yeah, when, when, I, when I mentioned that, I was kind of thinking more about there's the potential to find those people in the audiences of the people like Peter. Oh, I'm finding them. Oh, and you mm. got to realize, I've been doing this 20 years. 20 years ago, I was batshit crazy. Now everybody wants to talk to me. Yeah. That's a consequence of being more right and less wrong. And and don't 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 make uh, don't make a mistake. I just did a podcast with one of my good friends, Ted Achozo, that just came out two days ago, where it's two decentralized guys talking. And I said, look, I know there's going to be things that I talk about that I'm wrong about, you know, 15, 20, 30, 50, 60 years from now. But I got news for you. I know I'm a lot more right about these things than Peter, Sean or Saladino. That I can tell you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that yeah, makes sense. So you've been quite, I guess, damning of blue light. Uh, I spoke to an ophthalmologist about this, about like blue light, and he said the most of the blue light we get is from the sun. So is the issue but that that's, that's, that's no longer true? That, no? that is okay. You, no, you got to you got to hold his feet to the fire. What he said to you is factually true. From an evolutionary perspective, he's correct that the sun has a ton of blue light. But mm. is that the light that silly talking monkeys live under now? No, no, no. I was gonna, no. I was gonna say, is it blue light inherently isn't bad, but it's like isolated blue light at the wrong times is the problem. Correct. Yeah. Remember okay. that the the blue light from the sun never not has red. Mm -hmm. Well, is that true when you put your LED light on above you right now? Because since it's getting dark in your environment, no, no. But see that. That's the point that I'm trying to tell you about the nuance that's very difficult from my perspective. So you have to hold that ophthalmologist's feet to the fire. Just like I just told you that I have to ho hold Peter Adias, Saladino, and Sean Baker's feet to the fire. Why? Because when we make blanket statements mm -hmm. about light, realize that light is the most complex thing that's present in nature, and you really need to understand it well because... It has humongous nuance and, and humongous context. That's the reason why I told you that um, everything is an N equals one game. Hmm. Okay. So you mentioned red lights earlier and like fire. So if, if people are using artificial lights, like how can, what, what are like the best ones to use? How do you like minimize the effects? Well, ask me a better question. It is artificial light, can it replace the sun? The answer is no. Okay. Hard stop. So then the next question should be, so Jack, are you saying that the use of red light at night also has negative consequences? The answer is yes. Didn't I just tell you that about fire and Neanderthals mm -hmm. and Homo sapiens? What did I say to you 45 minutes ago when I said it's July 4th and you need to get up at 3.45 a.m. and see the sun? and go to bed at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I told you that's the way to do it, mm -hmm. didn't I? Yeah. So why are you trying to change the story on me now? See, my story is not gonna change, my friend. It's gonna be exactly the same. Nothing replaces the sun. Let me be very clear. Mm -hmm. The sun is Tina. You know what Tina stands for? There yeah, is no, no alternative. alternative. Yeah. Got it? Okay. So if you wanna use artificial light, to fit with your high latitude modern living life, you can do that. But just so you know, you're still breaking nature's laws. Hmm. You're still closer to wasting your mitochondrial heteroplasmy when you do that. Your margin of safety isn't that good. And if you really think about what I just told you, you go back to the beginning of the podcast, you're like, oh shit. That means if I live at a high latitude, and I'm using those things. I even have less margin of safety if I do that. That's true. That is absolutely accurate to what we know to be true today. That doesn't mean I'm not telling you you can't do it. It just means that you need to be really careful about how you're running your biology. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if there were, like, ways that were kind of less damaging. Because I know people do get or excited about like red lights and use red lights and, and not like white lights or whatever. Yeah. Well, let's put it this way. 
I think people that use red lights have more freedom uh, when they're at low latitudes. I think people that live at high latitudes, it's a very dangerous situation. Um, if you were to ask me, this is where I think the um, people at the UK, people in Scandinavia get it right. The best use of light at high latitudes is what the Swedes and the Norwegians do. They use geothermal pools. Remember, infrared B and C light is what they get when they do sauna, real sauna, not the fake shit that people are buying now. I'm talking about geothermal pools. That I'm okay with. Uh, but when it comes to light, I think the only light that I would use if I lived at high latitude in 2023 is probably candlelight or fire at night. That's it. I'm not even a big fan of using red light if I lived at the 60th latitude. I'd be concerned about that doing mm. it over two, three, four, five, six decades. Yeah. Because the idea behind that is when the sun's down, there is no red light. Even like there is, when the sun exactly right. sun's setting, but after that. See? Owen, you're, you're smarter than you were an hour and a half ago. You're right. And that's what I'm concerned about. And do I know that red light at night actually disrupts melatonin? Do I know that it affects the cortisol melatonin cycle? It does. And when you're at high latitude because you have no light stability, it's even a bigger effect. Hmm. Okay. Another thing I heard so you you're opening you're open you're opening up the uh, the quantum probabilities now. Now you're beginning to realize why this stuff is a little bit difficult. Why when you actually hear it laid out and you understand it and you have this perspective, you go, Man, I need to think about my life a little bit differently the way I'm doing things. Mm. It's making me think it might be easier to live in El Salvador. <laughs> Well, of course it is. I, 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 we already talked yeah. about that a long time ago, but I still want you to know that I think you can make it where you're at, but you have to realize that you have to be a, a, a tougher than nails type of person. You have to be really like a Viking. And um, that's why those people were so hardy. They, they did things the right way. The, the problem is modern life. Like when I was in Edinburgh, you know, a couple months ago, I just, it was remarkable to me that it was July and I'm walking around and people were wearing down coats and it was like 70 Fahrenheit. I'm walking around literally in t-shirts and shorts. I, I will never forget when I was in Iceland, it was 64th latitude. It was probably 50 Fahrenheit, 30 mile an hour winds again in t-shirt and shorts. And old ladies were coming up to me who are European going, sir, aren't you cold? And I looked at them and I said, aren't you sick and tired of being sick and tired? And they just looked at me. They don't get it. And I know they don't get it. I don't, I know people don't get this perspective, but I want them to. This is the reason why I do podcasts with guys like you, not to be provocative. People will think that this is provocative. It's not. It's actually very accurate. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Jack, how can we use like light to our advantage if someone's just trying to optimize kind of their health, biology, other areas of their life, or even for like athletic performance? Oh, the number one thing is look at the way the sun rises and sets where you're at and maximize it. It's simple. Mm -hmm. If you know you only have eight hours of sunlight a day, make sure that you never miss one minute of it uh, uh, when it's eight hours. When it's 12 hours, make sure you get that. When it's 16 hours or 17 hours, try to get as much as you can. But make sure that when the sun sets, all light sets where you are. Make sure that when it's zero degrees C out, all your windows are open. And that is coming in on you. If you want to put a blanket on, great. But make sure that your body is feeling that temperature, especially on your face. Because most people usually don't put the blanket over their face. Because then the mammalian dive reflex is working in you. It still works. Um, and the flip side of that is, you know, if you're living at a low latitude, the same things are in place. And this is where it's a huge problem, you know, at the 13th latitude. When it's 630 at night or 7 o'clock at night there, it's pitch black. Like, it's so dark. Like, people who come from the U.K. are down there and it's like July and it's dark at 7 o'clock. They're kind of stunned. 
that means that's where life ends. So your nightlife at low latitudes is designed to be kind of boring. What you want to do is live most of your life during the light. And that's what we are. We're creatures of light. That's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. So I know we have like the the super chasmatic nucleus. I think I'm saying that correctly. The like yep. detect, detects light in our eye. But you, you mentioned you want the cold on your face. Do we like what kind of do we have like receptors for cold on our face? Absolutely. It's, that's uh, stuff that I wrote about 20 years ago I called the mammalian dive reflex. And it turns out those cold receptors, they actually pay attention to that leptin melanocortin pathway. Uh, that's the reason why when a baby is born, it doesn't take its first breath. Remember, it came from a cold, wet environment. So when it's born and it's born into an air driven environment, there's a huge temperature difference. Uh, babies will take their first breath when they're born into the air. But the what do you see that most humans do? Um, from an evolutionary perspective, they bore their their live birth in the ocean. And the babies don't take their first breath when they go into the water. They wait till they come to the surface. How do they make that decision? It's tied to the temperature change on their face. And that should explain to you why modern humans get obstructive sleep apnea for the same reason. Because their temperature regulators in the hypothalamus are broken. How do you like that? Yeah, I've, I've not heard anything about this before from any of your, your stuff. That's very interesting. Well, it's written about in the cold thermogenesis series at jackcruise.com. You go back and put mammalian dive reflex in Jack Cruise, and I guarantee you, you'll see a ton of it. Yeah. That's the basis of how cold thermogenesis works in us. Hmm. Every single mammal on this planet has the mammalian dive reflex. Doesn't matter what type of mammal you are. Every single one has it. And it's linked to that leptin melanocortin pathway. I was speaking to my friend the other day about uh, the podcast you did with Huberman and Rick Rubin. And there was this point, I, I, he was asking me about it, and I couldn't explain it properly. So hopefully, we'll be able to help out here. I, I understand that the little mammals, um, after the, the, what's it called? Has the KT event um, were like making light inside of them, but how does that like negate their need for food? It doesn't negate their need for food. They are actually able to make food from the POM C gene. Remember, the POM C gene also has another part of it. We talked about the alpha MSH part, but we didn't spend a lot of time talking about is the other big part called ACTH. So from ACTH is adrenocorticotropin uh, releasing hormone. That's the precursor for cortisol. What do you know about when you give somebody cortisol? What does it make in their body? It's, it's glucose. It raise glucose and insulin, yeah. There you go. So you're able to actually make glucose directly from light. So what does that tell you about the POMC gene? POMC gene is actually tied to animal photosynthesis. Well, what does the NHS have to say about animal photosynthesis? They think it's preposterous. Yet, you know that every mammal has POMC in them. You know that humans do, but yet they tell you that you can't. And how many times have you seen the picture on my Twitter feed where I always show you that putting on LED light alone, what does it do? It raises blood glucose and it raises insulin. Mm. So hard stop. What does that tell you? That light creates glucose. What do you know about high glucose and high insulin? shrinks your brain. What do you know about the mammals that were present at the KT event? Were they were they mammals that had Ferrari engines in their head? No, little things. No. Right. See, they were different mammals than we are today. So what does that tell you about mammals today that are living under light that is like the KT event from blocking the sun? They're shrinking their brain? There you go, bro. Now you understand why Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and neurodegeneration are playing the role that they're playing today. You're beginning to understand the flip side of the story. But remember, the original story for the mammals was this allowed them to survive a poor light environment while the dinosaurs were dying because there was no sunlight there. They could live off a poorly lit environment because they could make enough glucose 
to survive until photosynthesis came back. And then what happened? Then what happened is they took their main semiconductor that was on their surface and mm -hmm. internalized it. Why? Because it turns out melanin turns sunlight and is able to make the biggest charge separator of water to create both protons, electrons, and hydrogen. And what does our mitochondria use? H plus. Hydrogen. Hydrogen heat engine. What's the difference between photosynthesis and melanin in terms of uh, photosynthesis? Photosynthesis is done with chlorophyll. It creates two electrons in the photostem. What does melanin create? Four electrons, double the amount. What else does melanin create? It creates H2 and O2. Does O2, is O2 used by the mitochondria? Yep. What is H2, two hydrogen protons? That's inside the mitochondria. Why is all um, mammal melanin tend to be right around the colony of mitochondria inside a cell? Now you know the reason why. Because it's creating the things that the mitochondria needs. Oh. See, these are all the, the implications of the Uberman podcast that people just didn't get. Why? Because remember, that podcast wasn't designed uh, to give you all those little nuances. That's what my blog does. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what other podcasts do. It was that that podcast was designed by Rick to be a conversation between three mammals to discuss how evolution and why centralized and decentralized medicine has a radically different perspective. That's kind of what you and I just did in this podcast over the last hour and 45 minutes is I focused more on light, darkness, and time for you to get you to really understand why Newton and Einstein are different. Now you're beginning to see how the melanin story fits into this because melanin actually makes the clocks in you even more accurate. It's creating the raw materials from the things inside of cells that you need to run your mitochondria and to run um, the programs in you. You need electrons, you need protons, and you need oxygen. That is the raw materials that run the program in your mitochondria. And mammals that have gotten 65 million years away from the KT event are the most dependent on electrons, protons, and oxygen. The original mammals, they had more margin of safety because they didn't have big brains. Now mammals have huge big brains. And as soon as you take any of their melanin away from them, guess what happens? They get sick. Yeah, they got more to lose. You got it. It's a very similar story to what I told you about high latitude living, isn't it? So when you're a mammal that has a Ferrari engine, you can see why that maybe living in a high latitude is almost the same decision that happened at the KT event. Maybe Uncle Jack is trying to get you to understand truly what I said to Uberman and truly what I said to Owen and marry the two concepts together. Hmm. Yeah. The, I think the sticking point that me and my friend were on was like, how, like, where are they making the light from? Because we're kind of like, are they just... Cause it, from it metabolism. Uh, but what's like the input into the system? Like, the input they... into system, electrons, protons, and light. Just remember that let, let's... I think the problem that most people have in biology is they don't understand physics enough. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this simple question. How does an LED light bulb make light? You just put electricity into it, right? And then, mm -hmm. then the semiconductor creates light. It's called the light emitting diode. Yeah. That's exactly what chlorophyll, that's exactly what mitochondria, that's exactly what melanin does. It also is a semiconductor. So how do you know that Uncle Jack is right about that? Well, that's when you have to go back and fact check me and go read about Robert O. Becker's work. You know, you read The Electric Body and you find out that collagen, he found to be a P-type semiconductor that emits red-brown light when you put a DC electric current in it. Well, just remember something. Collagen is the number one protein in your body. So what does that mean? That means you are capable of making an incredible light show inside of you. But what's the difference between say human brain 1.0, which I talked to you about, which is the cephalopod brain that came 
to fruition about 500 million years ago. And our brain, when I open up the skull on someone later today when I'm on trauma call, will I see the light show that the cephalopod shows in Huberman's lab? The answer is no. Why? Because over 500 million years, the melanin that was on our exteriors are now on our interior. That light is all conserved. And where is that light given off to? Just as Becker told you, into water in the system, to other semiconductors into the system. It's, it's contained within the system. In cephalopods, it's not. Why? Because they come from a time that was much simpler on Earth. Yet, here's the interesting part. Cephalopods and man still exist on this planet today at the same time. What does that tell you? That the same octave of the electromagnetic spectrum is still present. But the environments that mammals and cephalopods exist in is radically different, right? They're in the ocean and we're not. But yet, doesn't our brain swim in an ocean of CSF? Mm. Okay. That's the reason I told you that the cephalopod is human brain 1.0 and human brain right now is like 1,150,000 uh, version. Mm. It's had 500 million years to contain the light further so that it can be used for more complex findings. And what, what is the key semiconductor that has been used in the mammalian clay? Melanin. Mm. It's not hemoglobin. It's not chlorophyll. It was melanin. And what did the cephalopods do with that melanin? They used to expel it to get away from their prey, right? 70% of ink is melanin. Turns out in us, we keep all our melanin in our substantia nigra, in our neurons, everywhere inside of us. Anything that's made out of neuroectoderm, we have POMC, we have alpha MSH. That makes us very, very unique. That perspective is really, really important for you and your friends to get. Because it turns out when you two guys from the UK and you're sitting in the bar in the middle of the night, you're both looking at each other with your blonde, uh, blonde hair, white skin and blue eyes, realize that most of your melanin is on the inside. And just by the virtue of you sitting in that bar, you're fucking this whole program up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you're decreasing the amount of light that your semiconductors make inside of you. I, I, I understand that, like, that metaphor with, like, the diode. But I'm trying to... I'm... Not a metaphor. It's actually accurate. This is... Oh, okay. Yeah. I tell you, diode. it is absolutely the same thing. Mm -hmm. You create light from a semiconductor. Anytime yeah. you put any energy source in, just so we're clear on this, if you put electricity in, like a DC electric current or AC current, you will make light. Mm -hmm. A light frequency will change. What determines it is what type of semiconductor it is and how it's band gapped. Okay? That's what changes the frequency. Yeah. So the same thing is true about um, other semiconductors. For example, the guy who figured this out originally, he was an Indian, but he was in the UK. His name is Chandrendra Bose. You can look up his work from 1890 to 1801. How did he figure it out? He actually had a fan on a light that was sitting on a broken piece of silicon. And the light came through the fan, and he noticed that there was a spark or a change in an oscilloscope every time that happened. So he's the first person that discovered piezoelectricity. That means just from compressing a semiconductor, you create light. Think about that for a minute. Then there's ferroelectric current. Then there's pyroelectric current. What does that mean? Pyro means you change the temperature of the semiconductor and you change the light emission. Ooh, that should get you kind of interested based on our discussion for the last two hours. That just changing the temperature changes the light that gets emitted from the semiconductor. Mm -hmm. I like that. Starting to see how this works. Yeah, it's all like, it's so interesting how when you lay it out, there's kind of connections between everything which you might not first see. Right. And that, guess what? That is what makes this the greatest story ever told. That's the reason why so many people have been interested in the Uberman Rubin podcast, because guess what? I opened Pandora's box. And you're now beginning to understand how a decentralized clinician really sees the world of circadian biology. And then you begin to see the implications 
and what it means when you and your mates are sitting in the bar or what it means for Finnish people who are doing all the wrong things and why they got type one diabetes or why people are, who are now working for Facebook at the 20th latitude in Bangalore are getting type two diabetes for the first time in 5,000 years. Mm-hmm. In other words, you begin to put pieces together where you can explain it, where your idiot consultant doctor in the NHS is impotent to fix this, to even understand it. But Owen Sheesby now, who's now gone from the light to the dark in two hours with me, now is beginning to understand some of the magic that was in that Uberman Ruben podcast. Why? Because you've asked some good questions. I've given you some provocative answers. I've taken you down some dark pathways that you didn't expect that we were going to go when we started talking about Newtonian physics and Einsteinian physics and time relativity and how it relates to light and light emission. And we're ending it right now with light emissions from the semiconductors that are created inside of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good stuff. It's been, it's been great. Yeah. I just, I just, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not getting this, but like, the diode makes sense, but I'm trying to understand the small animals in, the, they were like underground, so they didn't have light coming in from the sun and photosynthesis was blocked. So like, like they had some light. I mean, they? photosynthesis okay. was blocked, but was the entire spectrum, you know, knocked oh, out? Okay. Yeah, they still had stuff. Just think about it like, for example, on a day in the UK, when it's cloudy out, are you getting UV? Are you mm. getting all the red? No, but you're still getting frequency yeah. through from that shitty light you're still able to make blood glucose right okay that's that's the piece yeah okay that makes sense got it mm-hmm. yeah all okay. right owen it's time for me to go yeah i think this is a good place to end uh if people want to find more of your work it's jackcruise.com and at dr jack cruz on twitter and instagram is there anything else to add there uh, you put at dr jack cruz pretty much everywhere you can find it if you put my name and you're a disease in a Google box, you'll find it. If you want more information, read my book on Amazon or sign up for Patreon, where I'll teach you how to be a quantum biologist and be a decentralized patient so you know more than your doctor. I'll put all the links to that in the show notes. Thanks so much, Jack. This has been really insightful. And I hope the right. audiences, they've enjoyed it as well. Thank you. All right. Take care, Owen. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye.